Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. We're going to continue on the Lord's Prayer, so go, ahead and go to Matthew 18, hold your spot. Once you find it, and we're going to come back to that. But the, the Lord's Prayer is from Matthew chapter 6. So once you find it, we're going to continue with the Lord's Prayer. We're praying this prayer. This is the model prayer that, that the Lord gave us. We can pray this when we wake up in the morning, when we go to sleep throughout the day. There's, there's power in this prayer. Let's pray it together. We'll have it up on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We've been going through the, systematically through the seven petitions that are inside this prayer. There are seven petitions inside this prayer. Every week we're going through, through just working our way through it. The first three petitions are the your petitions. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom, your will be done. See, we come into prayer focusing on the your, focusing on the king, focusing on the Lord. And then we, we go into the us petitions. A lot of people, make, we, 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 go in, we go in all about us, right? Us, 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 your is last. But see, Jesus is saying, you pray your name, your will. And then you go to the us petitions. There are four us petitions. Last week was give us this day. This is when we're asking God to, to meet our needs. And today, we're, we're uh, preaching on forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When Jesus says, Forgive us of our debts. He's referring to the forgiveness of sins. He's, he's speaking of sin as a debt. A debt as, as an account that's held against us. And Matthew 18 is probably one of the most powerful stories about this subject, about the forgiveness of a debt. Peter comes to Jesus and says, How often do I need to forgive my brother? And so Jesus proceeds to tell him a story. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to start at verse 23. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Scholars believe that the servants that he's referring to are attendants of the king. They're the tax collectors for the king. They're sent out to the various districts throughout the kingdom to collect the taxes from the citizens. And they, the, they, they bring the, the taxes back to the king and place it before the king, and he gives them their, their little commission out of it. So verse 24 says, And when he had begun, the king had begun to settle accounts to receive the taxes from the collectors. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. What in the world is a talent? Well, in, in those days, the, the currency was measured by weight. A talent. What's a talent? A talent, one talent, is equivalent to roughly around 75 pounds. All right? So he says he owes 10,000 talents at 75 pounds. So 10,000 times 75, what is that? What, what does that come to? Any math? 750,000. 750,000 pounds that he owes. Now, the, the currency would have been silver or, or gold. So we're looking at 750,000 pounds of silver or gold. So I was just doing some calculations. And, and at today's price of silver, you take the today's price of silver per ounce, you multiply that all the way out, it comes to about 288 million. <laughs> that would be at the low end. I, then I got creative. I said, well, what would gold be? Well, gold has gone up since people are freaking out and they're worried about inflation and all that. So people's coming into gold. So we're around $1,900 an ounce for gold. $1,900. Basically, you do the math, it, it breaks the calculator <laughs> of what gold, of what he would have owed if it would have been gold. It's, it's an astronomical figure. The point is, he owed a lot. He owed a lot. And it says in verse 25, but as he was not able to pay... Uh, that's, he was not able to pay. He's before the king. He was not able to pay. He must have 
squandered all of that money, all of that wasted. His master, the king, commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. You know, the tragedy here is that not only did the servant bankrupt himself and enslave himself, but he, but he also brought that, brought that bondage and enslavement to his family, to his wife, to his children, which says that uh, men, women, our choices, what we do affects our family, doesn't it? Our, our stupidity. Uh, you know, the, the Bible says the sins of the father is passed on through the generations. See, see, he's bringing enslavement not just to himself for his greediness, for his poor decisions, but his wife is suffering. His, his children are suffering. But here's his only option. It says in verse 26, The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I'll pay it back to you. I'll pay it back to you. Do you really think he's going to be able to pay this back? Hundreds of millions into billions and trillions of dollars. Of course not. Something amazing took place. Verse 27 said, Then the master of that servant, the king, was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion and released him and forgave him of all that debt. That's a compassionate king, isn't it? Not too many kings that compassionate. You know, it, it, yeah, you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to rot in prison or off with your heads, you know, hang them, wh whatever. But, but the compassion draws this, com the king to, to release him. He, the man goes from being enslaved with his entire family to becoming free. But, but even more, the com king completely absolves him from this unpayable debt, this debt that he could never repay. And here's the question we need to ask ourselves. The, the question is, was the king, did the king release this man because the man did a good job of convincing him, I'm such a good guy, I just made a mistake, I promise you I'll pay you back. And the king said, okay, you can pay me back, I'll put you on a payment schedule. Or did the king release him simply because the king's good and compassionate and merciful? He's good, he's compassionate. The king showed mercy on this man. I think you kind of see where, where Jesus is trying to take his disciples navigating through the releasing of debts. Because when we read this story, we can't help but think of a debt that we owe that is so much greater than the financial debt this servant owed. It's the debt of sin, sin's debt. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23 that, that the wages of this sin debt is death, eternal death. But thank God he's compassionate, right? Thank you for a compassionate king, a king of, of mercy, a, a king of, of grace that, that sent Jesus to take care of, of our sin debt for us. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says that he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that were against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. See, Jesus became our sin debt by being nailed to the cross and sacrificed on our account. He became the debt. The Bible says he became sin who knew no sin. He didn't just die for our sin. He died as our sin. He, he took the debt upon himself. He willingly went to the cross, and, and then he cried out, he cried out, it is finished. It is finished. You know what it is finished means? It is finished is basically a declaration. I, I've paid the debt. Paid in full. That's what that means. Paid in full. Our debt of sin has been canceled because the finished work of Jesus. It is finished. It is finished. They're free. They're free. We owed a debt we couldn't pay, but Jesus paid a debt he didn't know so that our slate would be completely clean, absolved, a clear slate. Aren't you glad for a clear slate? Those who place their trust in his sacrifice alone, 
Those who say, you know what, I could never repay this debt, but I'm putting all my trust in what Jesus did for me. Those who place their trust in the sacrifice of Jesus. We now stand before the king forgiven. Accounts settled. The debt's been paid. Closed accounts. Aren't you glad for that rubber stamp? Closed accounts. See, that's what Jesus did for us. But believe it or not, it actually gets even better than that. It gets better than that, yes. You know, the gospel, uh, the best definition I've heard for the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel is the nearly too good to be true good news of what Jesus has done. Nearly too, not just good news. It's nearly too good to be true. Good news of what Jesus has done. The best illustration I've heard about this, the nearly too good to be true good news of what Jesus has done, the best illustration is this. Imagine owing a bank $5 million. You know that you can never repay that debt. The bank president calls you up, and he says it's time to settle up, similar to the story we just read. It's time to settle up. You need to come in here tomorrow morning, you need to get in here and you either need to pay the debt off, we're calling the debt, we're calling the loan in, you either need to pay it off or we need to work out something, some kind of payment structure to where you can pay this thing back. So you go into the, the, the bank the next morning. The president of the bank, he comes down to meet you in the lobby. And he comes down with this weird look on his face because he says something miraculous has, has happened since, since I last spoke to you. Someone has come in and paid off your debt. You no longer owe the debt. Now, that's good news, isn't it? Here's the nearly too good to be true good news about it. He said, not only has the man paid off your debt, but he deposited an extra $25 million into your account to ensure that you could never get back into debt again. That's nearly too good to be true good news, right? That's the gospel. It's more than just paying off your sin's debt. If the debt was just paid off, that means you could just walk right out of the bank and get right back into debt again, right? <laughs> your stupid self, you take, pay off your credit card, I'll never get back into debt again. And you see, uh, an, an, something new comes out. Oh, I gotta have that clothes. I gotta have that new this. I gotta, I gotta have that new TV. And you whip out that, that credit card and, and you get, but, but see, here's the nearly too good, true, to be true good news. The gospel says that Jesus, he not only paid off our debts, but he overpaid our debts by depositing his righteousness into our accounts. He overpaid and deposited his righteousness into our bankrupt account as an overpayment to ensure that we could never get back into sin's debt again. You got to just let that sink in. told you this is nearly too good to be true that's why this makes the religious people uncomfortable that's why this makes the do-gooders uncomfortable <laughs> those who are trying to earn salvation those who are trying to earn their forgiveness because what this means now it doesn't mean it doesn't mean the overpayment of sin's debt that we can never get back into sin's debt again it doesn't mean that we that we'll never sin again it doesn't mean we come we become perfect people because we are imperfect people, we live in sinful flesh, right? We all make mistakes. We all sin. But what this means is that when the king sees us now, he doesn't see us as sinners, filthy, wretched sinners. He sees us as he sees his own son. He sees us with an overflowing bank account of righteousness. That has been deposited. He sees us as the righteousness of Christ. Righteousness means right standing. He sees us as justified, just as if I've never sinned. So the debt of sin can never be placed upon us again because of the deposit of Christ's righteousness into our account. That's good news. That's Good news. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, here, so here's my first point. Forgive us our debts 
first of all recognizes that we're debtors to sin. We, we owed a heavy debt, but through Christ, number one, our debt has been forgiven. Our debt, all debt has been forgiven. All sin, past, present, and future has been forgiven. Do you know that? Do you know that 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, he had you in mind. He already forgave every sin you'll ever commit on the cross. He paid. See, we got to tap into that forgiveness, right? He's already taken care of the debt. He's already paid the price. He's already forgiven us and cleansed us and, and placed us in right stand. We just got to receive that. We just got to receive that. It also means that, that even when we do sin, even when we do fail, we can always run back to the king. We can run back to the king. We can run back to, back to the Lord in, in repentance and humility and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. I know I sinned against you. I know I failed you, but, but I, I'm asking for your mercy. I'm asking for your forgiveness. And every time, every single time, he will say, you're forgiven clean clean no shame no condemnation every single time every single time that's the forgiveness of sin but then the story takes a terrible turn it says in verse 28 but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii a hundred denarii would roughly be about ten grand okay one denarii is a day's wage. And he laid hands on him. And he took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. Verse 29, so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So the same Man, same scoundrel that was forgiven hundreds of millions of dollars, this astronomical debt that he could never repay, is now demanding someone else to be thrown in prison who owes him money. I mean, this is deja. He did the same thing that this guy's doing, he did to the king. The king had mercy and forgave him. Now, 10 grand is a large debt, that's a lot of money. But in comparison, in comparison to what he's just been forgiven from, it's a drop in the bucket, right? The king's just showered mercy and forgiveness on this man, and yet he refuses to extend the same mercy and forgiveness to someone who owed him and wronged him. He even just, it didn't even compare to what he was forgiven from. And I want to pause and to just say this. I think it's safe to say that every single one of us at some time in our life has been wronged by someone, has been hurt by someone. We've all been hurt. We've all experienced the pains that have been inflicted on us by, by someone else. Maybe it was a friend who falsely accused you, a friend who defamed your character. Maybe it was someone that you trusted and maybe they stole from you. Maybe, maybe someone owes you money and said, I'll pay you back and you've been trying to get that money back and they're avoiding you and then it's ruined your relationship. And Maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was a spouse that betrayed you or abused you, a, a close relationship. And it hurts, doesn't it? It's painful. It's painful when you're wronged by someone else. It's, it's, it's hard to deal with. It's hard to deal with. It's hard to process. Doesn't it always hurt the most when it's someone that's close to you? Isn't that where the most pain comes from? When it's someone close to you? When David was running from Saul, his father-in-law, he was running from his life, David, David said... He said, you know, he said, if, if this was my enemy, it wouldn't even bother me. But the fact that it was someone close to me, that's what hurt the most. 
Maybe you're going through this right now. I mean, personally, personally, I know what it's like to be betrayed by a spouse. I'm pastoring, and my wife, ex-wife, is committing adultery, and she takes off. That's hard to process, and I'm, I bet some people there, you've got that same you, adultery, whatever, you're, you're going. It's hard to process. It's, it's hard to deal with. But it hurts the most when people close to you hurt or betray you. It hurts when your Christian brothers and sisters hurt you and betray you. Do you know in all my years as a Christian, all my years of ministry, do you know I've never, I've never been hurt by an unsafe person? <laughs> I've never been hurt by an unbeliever. My deepest pain has come from Christians. <laughs> church people. That's why a lot of people run from, that's why, that's why a lot of people, they don't even want to come into church. I ain't going into church. You know, they, they take it out on God. God wasn't the one who did this to you. <laughs> because a church member hurt you. A church member judged you. You came in with, with hurts and pains and, and you were looking for somebody to, to love you, but instead of loving you, you had some self-righteousness hypocrite. Yes, self-righteous hypocrite shame you, condemn you, and you run, you run. Oh, Christian brothers and sisters. Christian brothers and sisters. That's the hardest pain. That's the hardest pain. You, 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 you go to Israel. You know, we're, we're with Christians united for Israel. We're trying to seek relationship with Jews and and we wonder why, and, and we wonder why, why Jewish people are often standoffish when we try to develop a relationship with them. I'm a Christian pastor. Well, the first thing that goes into their mind is it was the Christians, the Crusaders, that came through. The Christian people came through, saying, marching as soldiers, killing off the Jews. It was the so-called Christian. Hitler called himself a Christian, got his inspiration from Martin Luther, who Killed millions of Jews. So, so it, it's the ones that are closest to you that hurt you the most. We've all had reasons to harbor bitterness, haven't we? We've all had reasons to harbor unforgiveness. I think we've all had people that we've confided in and we've trusted in, and they've turned on us. Maybe, you know, the, I, th I think it's Proverbs 3, verse 10 says, presumption leads to strife. We've all had Christian brothers and sisters who presume things about us that aren't true and they feel the need. They got to spread it through. Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about so-and-so? Spreading gossip, spreading. And then what happens is they bring their family in on it and they're spreading this. You got whole families that, that have this root of bitterness and, and, and they're believing a lie and, and, and it hurts when this happens. But here's what we've got to remember. Remember. That in comparison to our sin debt that Christ released us from, what others have done to us is nothing in comparison to what was done to him. That's the perspective. As mistreated as we think we might have been, it doesn't compare to the mistreatment that Jesus bore on our behalf. He was innocent, yet he was betrayed, reviled, abused, Shamed, disgraced, beaten, crucified by his own. His own. He came to his own and his own received him not. But yet Jesus received it. And, and what did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them. Release them from this debt. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they, they don't know what they're doing. Here's point number two. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors, says this, that since our debt has been completely forgiven by God, number two, we must forgive the debts of others. We must forgive the debts of others. Why do we need to forgive? Number one, because Jesus commands it. And number two, because unforgiveness brings personal bondage to your life. Look at the rest of the story. Verse 31 says, So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved. 
And they came and told the king all that had been done. Then his master, the king, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And then he says, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So my heavenly Father will also do to you. Do you know this is a promise? And this is somehow we are about how we are about God's promises. We, we claim all the promise. Oh, he's going to supply my need. He's going to give me health. He's going to get, I claim that promise. But this is a promise here. So the Father will do to you. If you don't forgive. The point here is that the unwillingness of the servant to forgive his debtor, it only led to his own imprisonment. It only led to his own bondage and torture. We're only bringing bondage and torture to ourselves when we refuse to forgive and release the debts of our offenders. Your offender is walking free, living life while we're the ones in bondage. We're the ones in bondage. Jesus said the king turned him over to the torturers. <laughs> That's pretty harsh. And then he said, this is what the Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brother. Webster's Dictionary defines torture as agony of body and or mind. Now look, let me clarify something. Jesus is not saying that if you do not forgive, he's going to cast you into hell. That goes against the gospel. He's not saying he, the Father's going to throw you into hell if you don't forgive. He's not saying that. What he's saying is this. When we refuse to forgive our debtors, the door opens for the torturers to come in. Now, who do you think the torturers are? Demons and devils and Satan. When we refuse to forgive, it, it's as if God, the king, lifts his protection off of our life and allows the, the demons and the devils to come in and inflict havoc upon our life and inflict torture upon our life, on our mind. The battle fills the mind, even our body. Unforgiveness and bitterness brings torture. Unforgiveness and, and harboring bitterness makes you miserable. You're miserable. It leads to depression. You can't sleep. You're thinking about all the wrongs. You're lying. Y'all looking at me like, like oh, man, I, I ain't never had this happen to me before. I mean, y'all to see some of this. I'm going to tell you something. I've lied in bed saying, God, I wish you would bring the hammer down. Bring it down. I don't deserve this. You're, th you're, you're, you're just rehearsing in your mind how sweet it is for revenge. Oh, this would be so sweet. Those, tor those tortures have got a hold on your mind. And then it's just, it's just consumed you. It it's eats you up. You're, you're thinking about payback. You're consumed by it. They, they, you, your mind has been released to the torturers. They're, they're robbing you of your joy. They're robbing you of your peace. Bitterness and unforgiveness can even lead to physical illness. High blood pressure. Broken down immune system. You're, you're, you're stressed and, and, you can't, and, and you're, you're always sick and, and, and you're, you're heart issues and, and it's because we've been turned over to the torture. See, that's what, that's, what, that's what we're talking about here. And I guarantee you, some of you have experienced this before and, and it's torture and it's, and it's agony and you can't let go. So how do we break free from that? How do we break free from, from this emotional and, and physical bondage? Number three, you said it, forgive. 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 Forgiving the debts is what brings freedom. Forgiving. When you release them from their debt against you, you're releasing yourself from the bondage, from the torture of soul, from, from the agony that's on you. 
When you release them, listen, when you release them, and that's what forgiving the debt is, it's, it's, you're releasing it, you're, you're releasing it. When you release them, you're releasing yourself. Letting go. Releasing. So that means that forgiving your debtor is actually more for your freedom. Forgiving your debtor benefits you. It benefits you. We forgive. We release. No matter how hard it is. You might say, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. Oh, forgive. No, that's not forgiveness. You haven't forgiven anybody. Forgiveness is releasing. Letting go. Releasing. Letting go. Now, let me say this. Let me say this. Forgiveness isn't pretending that nothing happened to you. Forgiveness isn't pretending that you weren't hurt. Forgiveness is not living in denial. Furthermore, forgiveness doesn't mean you have to keep being a doormat. Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to keep being steamrolled. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you, that, you need to, that, that you keep allowing yourself to be an emotional punching bag, a physical punching bag. It doesn't mean that forgiveness doesn't mean you have to stay in an abusive relationship. You don't, you don't have to keep running back to the abuser. Matter of fact, that's not forgiveness. That's foolishness. I mean, I tell people, if, 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 a, if a woman is in a, an abusive relationship... And they've started, and, and the man has started abusing the kids. At that point, if you stay, if you stay connected to that, you're bringing endangerment to your kids. And see, now that that's when it really gets serious, right there. See, because I, I want you to see the whole perspective. Forgiveness doesn't always mean. Forgiveness doesn't always mean. Let's say if it's somebody outside your. Forgiveness doesn't always mean that you got to jump back and resume relations just like it was before. Forgiveness simply means release the debt. Release the debt. Now, if you're a husband and a wife, you need to work it out. You need to work it out. There's a lot of forgiveness in a marriage relationship. I'm not, I, I, by no means am I saying that we, that we just cut the cords. and, and all. No, 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 no. I think you, you understand what I'm saying. We, 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 we forgive one another. Forgiveness. Releasing. I'm releasing. I'm letting go. I'm releasing the debt. I'm releasing the weight. I'm releasing the baggage. I'm letting God handle this. I'm letting God handle this. Maybe you were the offender and you need to go to another and admit you were the wrong. You were the one who did the wrong. James 5.16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be Healed. In other words, the healing and freedom comes when you can go to another person and say, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you tell them your trespasses and, and, you, and you seek forgiveness. That's, that's when the person, the, the one, the, the, the big man, the big woman who went to that person and says, I'm sorry, that's the one that's going to receive the healing. Maybe your struggle of unforgiveness and bitterness is not towards others, but maybe it's towards yourself. Maybe you feel like a failure, a loser. You've done something that you just can't forgive yourself for. You've committed what you think is the unpardonable sin. God will never forgive me. Remember, God is already forgiving. There's only one sin that God cannot forgive, and it's the sin of rejecting Jesus. Every other sin. There is no sin past the scope of God's grace and forgiveness. The only sin is rejecting Jesus. He forgave you. He released your debt. Maybe some of you need to release your own debt and be free. You're living under shame. You're living under condemnation. Jesus bore that shame. Jesus bore that condemnation. You can be free. You can be free. Why are we holding on to what God has released and forgotten? Hebrews 8 verse 12 says, And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. It's not that God has amnesia. It's, it's that he willingly forgets. He willingly refuses to bring that charge back against us. Forgive 
yourself. You know, that's why, that's why there's such wonderful ministries like Celebrate Recovery that we're, that we're really looking to start and would love to have you involved because this is, it's a ministry about freedom and forgiveness and forgiving yourself and being set free from shame and condemnation. We receive his forgiveness. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Receive his forgiveness. Come to him through Jesus. Release yourself from the guilt. Release others of their debt. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, actually, when you, when you think about all of this, this particular petition is the freedom petition. Out of all the petitions, this is the one where the freedom lies. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our... That's a declaration of freedom. I've been freely forgiven. Therefore, I can freely forgive. And I live free. And I live free. And I live free. Don't you want to walk in this freedom? Don't you think this is a needed message to the church? Bow your heads if you would. We've been forgiven. The debt's been paid. Receive it, receive it, receive it. And now we freely forgive others. We release others. We, we let it go, we let it go. We release, we release. We let God be God. We let God be judged. The Bible says vengeance is mine. I'll, I'll be the one that'll repay, says the Lord. If you're here today, if you're listening online and you've never received Jesus as your sin debt, please receive him today. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to show you how you can be free by receiving this sin debt being canceled. Don't, don't you want that? Don't you want to be free this morning? Don't, don't you want to be rid of the, the guilt and the, the weight and the baggage? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. You can't rid yourself. You, you, on your best day, you're not good enough. On your best day, your, your, your best act of holiness is still not good enough. That's why we go to Jesus and we trust in what he has done. He is the sin debt. He canceled the debt. I want to lead you in a prayer because that's what it's all about is salvation comes through believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, through praying, coming to the Father. And, I, and, and if you don't know you're, you're a Christian, you're saved today, can I, just, I want to just lead you in this prayer. I want to lead you in this prayer. From your heart, pray. From your heart, pray. Maybe, or maybe you, you, you have received Jesus, but maybe you're under condemnation. Maybe, maybe you're, you've got the, a load of shame and guilt upon you. Well, you can pray with me as well. Pray this. Say, Father, I'm coming to you in need of salvation. Father, I'm coming to you in need of salvation. I believe in Jesus. I accept what Jesus has done for me. I accept. I received the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus became my sin debt. All of my trust is in Jesus. I know that I can never, I can never save myself. I'm trusting in you. Just pray that I'm just trusting in you. I cannot save myself. I'm trusting in your sacrifice. Forgive me. I receive all the forgiveness from the cross. Forgive me, Lord, as a sinner. Wash me. Cleanse me. I receive what you did 2,000 years ago. I receive it. I apply it to my life. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for freedom. Thank him for freedom. If you ask him to forgive, he'll forgive. Because the fact is, he already has forgiven. You just confess it to him. You confess it to him. And here's what I want to do. While your heads are bowed, we're going to take communion in just a second. I'd like for you to just take 30 seconds or so and release those who've done you wrong. Is there, is there bitterness in your heart towards someone else? Is there a hurt or a pain that you need to release to the Lord? Before we take communion, why don't we do this? If you're holding on to a grudge, you're holding on, and it might have been bad, it might have been bad, but just say, God, I, I release, I release. I release. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to release because I know how it is. Your will wants to hold on. Holy Spirit, help me to forgive. Help me to release. Help me to release. Help me to forgive myself. I, I release. Help, help, whatever it is, 
you pray, you search your heart. The Holy Spirit will help you. You're just releasing. You're just releasing. Just letting it go. Letting it go. Turning it to God. I'm releasing. Father, you have released us. Freely we release others. We want to walk in forgiveness. We want to walk in freedom. We want to live in wholeness and victory. Thank you for your forgiveness. And now, Father, I just pray as we go into this time of communion, Lord, that we would be reminded of the cross and of the sacrifice that Jesus